I want to thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We've got another great service in store for you. Each week, we are seeing new people being drawn into the presence of God. Now, when I came to faith in Christ, there were three things that caused me to follow him. First of all, I felt his presence real strong. Secondly, I saw his power at work. And finally, I heard the truth of God's word. For the past 26 years, we've been committed to seeing lives transformed through these same three principles. We need your help to bring this life-changing experience to a generation that so desperately needs a foundation of faith. Now, if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please let us know. You can contact us or partner with us through our website at libertychurchmi.com. Take a minute and check it out. Now, here's today's message. I hope you enjoy it. So are you enjoying this series coming soon? Our study on the book of Revelation. Again, this is something that you all asked for. We did a little survey back in the late summer, early fall called You Asked For It. And so you asked for it. And so uh, this is some of the things. And I'm trying the best I can to take the positive, the high road of the book of Revelation. You know, we said it a few weeks ago. John said to encourage one another with these words. And so there are plenty of words of encouragement throughout these chapters next week. Uh, we'll bring a conclusion to this series. Uh, it'll be a, a Palm Sunday uh, service as well. It won't be a Palm Sunday message, but uh, come and celebrate Palm Sunday with us, one of my favorite holidays of the year. And you know, a lot of times when you study the book of Revelation, it is the last half, the last few chapters that people like to focus on. I don't, I don't know why it is, but in our world, in our culture, we like action. We like sometimes blood and guts, and uh, some people like horror films. That's one I don't get but some people like that type of stuff. Uh, we turn on the news and it's filled with tragedy and we get glued to those things. And I'm not sure why we're drawn to that, but we are. And so we're going to look today about uh, the second coming of Christ and this event that we call Armageddon. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Ar Armageddon? I, I do like that movie, one of my uh, favorites, action flicks. And uh, I tell you right now, they got it all wrong. <laughs> You know, Hollywood has a way of depicting things uh, to entertain us, but there's going to be nothing entertaining about Armageddon. It's not going to be a, a very quick episode that happens from space, but it's going to be a war right here on Earth where everything is destroyed. We get to Revelation chapter 16, and we get to the last set of judgments of God, the seven bowls the wrath uh, that God pours out upon the beast, the dragon, the false prophet, the antichrist, all of them turkeys are going to have their day and they will be punished for eternity. And uh, there should be a little uh, insert in your bulletin today that describes all the different seven bowls. I'm not gonna go into detail over all of those things, but basically through these judgments, the first one, everyone breaks out in sores, very painful. Uh, through the rest of them, the sea and the inland waters are turned to blood. It kills all sea life. People are burned uh, with the scorching heat of the sun. Darkness and pain is something that everyone will be experiencing. There'll be 75-pound hailstones that will rain down upon the earth, all culminating with an earthquake that will flatten the mountains and make islands disappear. You know, where past judgments that we talked about, the seals and the trumpets, a fraction of things were affected on the earth through these last seven judgments of the bowls, everything will be destroyed. We uh, are going to begin our journey this morning in Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to get just a little glimpse of it. We'll read the 8th and 9th and then 17th and 18th verse. It says, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. Can you imagine that? I don't know if you've ever had a sunburn before, but this is far worse than a sunburn, that God alters the sun in a way that people are just going to be seriously burned by the heat of it. And yet it's kind of, I believe, a glimpse of hell that God gives to these people, giving them one last opportunity to say, hey, man, that's not where I want to spend my eternity. That's not what I want to experience. But they still, it says, do not repent and give glory to God. Then it goes down, the seventh angel that brought uh, the seventh bowl says he poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout 
came from the throne in the temple saying, it is finished. Hallelujah. Have you ever heard those words in the Bible before? When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And again, heaven utters these words. It is finished. The redemption plan of God began with Jesus on the cross, and it is finished here by the seventh bowl, the seventh judgment of God. It says, then the thunder crashed and rolled, and lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck, the worst since people were placed on the earth. God will not destroy the earth until there is no one left who will repent. And I, I just love the mercy and the grace of God here. You know, so many people say, how can God do this? Can't you see that God is doing everything he can to try to get people to change from their wicked ways and to embrace him? And when it's evident, nobody will, that everyone left on the face of the earth is only evil continually and will not serve God, then God brings destruction upon the earth. You know, through these judgments, you read the third angel stops and pauses for a moment to pronounce how just God is. What do you mean just? It means this is not something that is unjust, that he gave everyone a chance and an opportunity. And so God is a just God. He's fair in everything that he did. And we read just a little bit here at the end of the sixth bowl judgment, all of the kings of the earth gathered together to fight at a place called Armageddon. I know it sounds stupid for people to come together and fight God, but many of us do it every day, don't we? Many of us fight God every day. All the armies of the earth ruled by this evil kingdom through the dragon and through the beast and the antichrist and the false prophet, they'll all come together to begin to fight God. And really this evil system, number two, is called Babylon. God will destroy Babylon. And we read about this in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Babylon is not just a place, it's a system of evil. It is, it is a, a belief. It is something that is a spirit, really, a spirit behind the evil and the wickedness on the face of the earth. We pick up that story beginning in verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, one of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. He said, come with me, and I will show you the judgment that's going to come upon the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The word waters in the Bible has always been symbolically referring to people. And so he speaks of this, this evil system or ruler that rule over many peoples. He says, he goes on, he says, the kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. You know, Babylon began, you can go all the way back into the book of Genesis with the building of the Tower of Babel. That's really the, the origin of the word, the name, the place Babylon, but the origin of the spirit obviously goes all the way back to Lucifer in heaven. And there were two corrupt aspects to the origins of Babylon. The first was a religious aspect, that people wanted to have the appearance and the desire of getting close to God. They were trying to build this tower that would reach into heaven. And they made it sound like we want to get close to God. But it wasn't about getting close to God. It was about power. It was about them trying to get higher than God. It was that spirit that Lucifer spoke those words in heaven. He said, I will ascend my throne above God. I will be like the Most High. They didn't want to just be close to God. They wanted to be like God. And, you know, we have that spirit, and I use the word religion and understand a lot of people misunderstand what religion is. The word religion is, is really only used, uh, I believe, once in the Bible, referring to taking care of widows and orphans. But religion has really become a, a spirit. It's a system of rules. It's a facade. It's a phoniness, I believe, that people uh, have here on the face of the earth where they want to be holy. They want to appear a certain way. It's an outward thing, an outward set of rules but it's got nothing to do with a relationship with God. We don't like to believe or, or embrace or pursue religion. We believe in, a, in pursuing a relationship with God. And really the spirit behind this, you see in the book of Revelation, is found in the false prophet. He fronts himself as a prophet. He, he wants people to believe that he's speaking the words of God, but his motives is, and his intentions are pure evil. And so religion is just outward. It's a ceremony. You know, throughout history, we see religion uh, displayed in, in things that appeal to the eyes. Back in, in the days of the Reformation, God moved because so much of 
the presence of God was religious. It was very outward. That's when they began to put statues in the churches and stained glass and priests began to wear these very ornate robes. And, you know, Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. They lacked the presence of God. They lacked the power of God. They lacked a relationship with God. So they were doing all these things outwardly as a facade to draw people in. It became an artistry. There's a lot of people that love religion because of it's like an art form to them and they're drawn to the to the uh, allure, the attraction of the facade that it has. But God is not an outward God. He is an inward God. He is a God that he said, I want you to worship me in spirit, on the inside and in truth. He wants you to have a relationship with him. And so the spirit of Babylon is a religious spirit. It, It accepts immorality to gain influence and control. I'll say that again. It accepts immorality to gain influence and control. A lot of people that are part of a religious system, that's what it's all about. It's about power. It's about control. It's about influence. The church in the Middle Ages, before the Reformation, many of the the, the spiritual leaders, the Pope, they became powerful figures, political figures in many ways. And it was very little about God and very much about them. And this is what Babylon represents here. It represents that lukewarm church that Jesus was dealing about with earlier in the book of Revelation. The second aspect, the corrupt aspect of Babylon was a political aspect. And we see in our world today these two powers, the religious aspect and the political aspect, and, and oftentimes even coming together. You see the political aspect in the form of the beast, wanting power, wanting control, wanting to be worshiped. And not, you know, I'm not putting all politicians down. Not all politicians are corrupt. Many of them get into it because they're, they sincerely desire to be great public servants and help people. But many of them get a taste of that power and that authority and that control, and it corrupts them. And so our world system today is filled with corruption, and that's what he's speaking about when he speaks about Babylon. And we see in chapter 18, there were four idols, four things, four aspects characteristics of Babylon that people embraced, that they began to take on. And this is what caused their fall and the destruction of Babylon. The first was an idol of obsession. We find it in the third verse of chapter 18. It was the fact that everyone wanted what Babylon had, that they saw Babylon, its its popularity, its power, its possessions, and everybody wanted it to the point where they worshiped it. They became obsessed with Babylon. And you know, we have a spirit of obsession in our world today. We've got to have that gadget, right? We've got to have that new designer fashion that everybody wants. We're obsessed with movies. We're obsessed with celebrities. We're obsessed with things in our world today. More than any other time that I can remember in our history, we're obsessed with things. And obsession is an idol. We get obsessed with things and they become idols in our lives. The second idol was an idol of self-sufficiency. You'll find that in verse 7, that the people of Babylon, they had everything they needed. They didn't need to rely on anyone or anything, including God, that they worshiped, and the people worshiped their greatness. They worshiped themselves. They were self-sufficient. And you know, more than any time since I've been involved in ministry, do I see this working in the world today. The people don't need church. They don't need God. They don't need to pray. They don't need the Bible. They're self-sufficient. You go up to somebody and try to bring them to church, try to win them to God, try to tell them about Jesus, and they'll say, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. I mean, even these people that were being burned during the judgment, I'm all right. I'm good. I don't need that. We all need God. We're all born with a hole in our lives, an emptiness on the inside of us that only God can fill. We're all born with desires, with appetites, with with things that we want, that we crave, that only God can fill. Only God can give you a joy that will satisfy you. Only God will give you a peace that, that, that will bring true peace into your life. Jesus says, I don't give peace like the world. It comes and it goes, I give peace that is from heaven. Hallelujah. Only God can give you that love that you're searching The third idol was an idol of comfort. You'll find that in the 14th through the 17th verse. They had no need for God and for his provision. You know, we live in a time where we don't commit to anything 
unless it's convenient, and unless it's comfortable. Nobody makes decisions to do things until the last minute. Babylon in this passage that we read in the beginning of Revelation 17 is referred to as a prostitute that has sold out her relationship with God for comfort, for convenience, for financial gain, for power. And I see that rampant in our world today, that people are selling out their relationship with God for something that this world has to offer. Whether it's a recreational thing, an entertainment thing, whether it's more money, whether it's more power, whether it's convenience, comfort, uh, comfort, whatever it might be. The Bible here refers to that as a form of prostitution where we sell out God and our relationship with him. And part of the spirit of prostitution is that we sacrifice purity for personal pleasure. Are you with me this morning? I know those are not encouraging words, but they're true. We live in a world today that sacrifices purity for personal pleasure. And this is all a form of idolatry. And it's what brought the destruction of Babylon. And unless we turn from our wicked ways, it will bring destruction into our lives too. Why? Because the fourth idol was an idol of deception. There are so many people that are deceived. They believe they don't need God. They believe that, that, that make yourself happy, you know, that, that pleasure is the most important thing in life. And we follow after the things of this world, and we're deceived. Sin deceives those who are lured into it, making you justify things and believe that what you're doing is right. And it's an idol, an idol of deception. And I want to tell you this morning, sin will leave you unfulfilled. Sin will leave you empty. I talked a minute ago about that hole, that emptiness in your life that only God can fill. You can try to fill it with a lot of other things, but it will leave you wanting more. It will leave you empty. Only Jesus can satisfy you. Only Jesus can satisfy that emptiness in your life. You think a relationship will do it. You think a person will do it. You think money will do it. You think a diploma will do it. You think popularity will do it. You think a new set of clothes will do it. You think a makeover will do it. None of those things will fulfill that emptiness on the inside of you. You can try it all. Millionaires have declared over the years, I I give it all up if I could only find fulfillment. Hugh Hefner once said, "I I give all of this up if I could find true love. He had everything that the world would say you would want as far as relationship or members of the opposite sex and pleasure but it brought him no fulfillment in his life. Only God can fulfill that emptiness on the inside of us. Those who follow the beast, they think they are right, but they've been deceived into this false religion. They've been deceived by this political power and ruler, and that system will be destroyed. And once it's destroyed... We read uh, just a little glimpse of it in uh, our, our text this morning, our first text. A vast heavenly crowd will begin to shout hallelujah as Babylon, not just a place, but the system of the world, the system of evil is brought down by the power of God. You'll hear all of heaven begin to shout hallelujah. You know, the word hallelujah is only found four times in the New Testament, and all of them are right here in the book of Revelation as they shout. Hallelujah. When they hear those words, it is finished, you'll hear a great roar. I was, many years ago, the promise keepers used to come here to Michigan and hold an event at the Silver Dome. For those of you that are younger, that was a stadium that used to be in Pontiac where the Lions played football. You know, you got to explain some of these things to the younger generation. I was umpiring a doubleheader yesterday for a couple colleges down at... uh, where Tiger Stadium used to be. The Detroit Police Athletic League has renovated it into a place where they can play baseball. And I'm uh, out in the infield in the second game, and I'm thinking, I'm looking at all these kids. They're in junior college. So most of them are under 21. I'm thinking, none of these kids ever went to a baseball game at Tiger Stadium. And so I started explaining them. I said, you realize you're playing on a field where Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron played baseball. Do you realize that? Like, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. 
How cool is that? Amen? Where was I? Let's get back to the... Oh, so I was at the Silverdome for this Promise Keepers event, and it was packed, 80,000 Christians in this stadium. And they asked all the pastors to come down to the stage. And so I'm way up in the nosebleed seats, and I make my way down to the, to the floor level, to the, uh, the turf level there where they played football. And I'm walking towards the stage, and as I am, 80,000 people are roaring. And I'm like, wow, man. I wanted to like bust a football move or something, you know, do a little Heisman Trophy pose. And it was just amazing to hear that. And this is just a, a, a fraction of what it's going to be like when Babylon falls and the, the millions of people in heaven are going to begin to roar with this shout of hallelujah. Amen. It's going to be an awesome sound. And when that begins to culminate, Number three in your outline, the bride is finally ready for the wedding day. We, the bride of Christ. It says in the 19th chapter, in the sixth verse, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, remember waters is people, and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to notice what it says there. It doesn't say God made her ready. It says the wife has made herself ready. Who's the wife? Who's the bride of Christ? We are. I've told you all along, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. How many of you men have ever waited for a woman to get ready? <laughs> I will not say any more. I feel eyes piercing through me right now this morning. But we will be united with God in the way that a bride is united with her groom, in a way that we've never experienced before. I know our culture is vastly different today. But God's intention for that wedding day is for a man and a woman to come to a place of intimacy for the first time and experience the, each other in a very deep and intimate way like they never have before. To see things about each other that they've never seen before. To be open and, and, and just transparent, vulnerable before each other and experience a glory like you've never experienced before. On that day, we will become one with God, just like a man and a woman become one flesh. We will become one with God. This is what we have to look forward to. And I, I read this verse in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15. I, I want you to remember at this point, too, we will have a glorified body, right? What do you mean a glorified body? You, you ever read stories in the Bible where people were just translated from one place to another, like they disappeared and reappeared here. When Jesus came back, he just walked through the wall, you know, of the place where they were meeting. That's the kind of body we're going to have. How cool will that be? I can't wait for that, you know? Just somebody in a room talking about you, and you just walk, hey, how's it going? <laughs> walk right through the wall. That'll be fun stuff. But it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 28, it says, when all things are made subject to him, that's right at this point, then the Son himself will all be, also be subject to him who put all things under him. And then it says that God may be all in all. Now, I tell you, you can chew on this for the next month. Just that one phrase. Everything will be made up of God and God will be in all. That we will be so intimately close with God that you won't be able to tell where we stop and God begins. You ever see a husband and wife that have been married for so long, they begin to look like each other? They begin to finish each other's sentences. They think like each other. They do something before the other one does, knowing, almost reading their mind. My wife's been trying to get me to read her mind for 35 years. I'm going to get there someday. I'm in trouble today. I can tell you that. right, Guys, pray for me. I'm in big trouble today. But we'll get to that point in our relationship with God where he will be all in all. And I'm not saying we will be God, but we will be so clothed with his glory and his presence 
that people won't be able to see us for seeing God. Amen. That he will be all and in all. Just chew on that for a little while. That's going to be so cool. And then we'll experience the second coming of Christ, our groom. Our groom. Look at what it says in the 11th verse of 19, chapter 19. And we're going to read quite a bit here. But it says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, that will be us at that time. I'm talking about us now. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. Hallelujah. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. The juice flowing from a wine press, like the juice flowing from a wine press. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together. Then I saw Bruce Willis on a spaceship. No, 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 sorry. That's not how it happened. Saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. I tell you, it's going to be an amazing thing. And we will experience it. Not only is Jesus coming on a white horse, but we're all going to have a horse to ride on too. And we'll be right there as part of his army. Do you ever want to get back at Satan? Here you go. Here you go. You will be with Jesus as he comes back and destroys every force of evil, everything that's ever attacked you, everything that's ever hurt you, everything that's ever discouraged you and bothered you, every sickness and, and, and the, uh, the uh, origin of every disease in your life, you will have that opportunity to be right there, riding with the Lord to destroy it. Before this begins, if you read through the judgments of the six bowls, you see that, uh, every form of life is destroyed but the birds. And the birds are put on alert to be ready to devour what is left. And we see at the end of this that the birds were filled with what was left, the flesh of the people that were destroyed on the earth. All the saints will join Jesus in his triumphant return. And Satan and his kingdom is conquered, it says here, by Jesus, who is called the Word of God. Now, I want to encourage you with that this morning because you can conquer today with the Word of God. That we have a two-edged sword that we speak out of our mouth. If you ever read that passage where it describes the, the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the preparation of gospel, gird your loins about with truth. And it says, above all, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I like to say it this way because there's no punctuation in the Bible, which is the Word of God praying. See, we have this resource today that there's armor to protect us, but we've got a weapon. We've got a resource to fight back. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to pull down the kingdoms of darkness. And it is the word of God that will ultimately destroy him then and all of his kingdom and everything. And it is the word of God that will take him out of your life today. That we overcome him by the word of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness three different times, he responded every time by saying, it is written. He knew that there's power in the word of God. And you possess that right here in your heart. 
That's the reason why we focus on the word of God. I like to try to get as much of it into you on Sundays as we can so that you can take it home with you and use it as a weapon. Devil, it is written. I will worship the Lord my God and him only will I serve. Satan tries to tempt you with all the treasures and, and, and uh, things of this world to get you to begin to embrace materialism. He did it with Jesus. Jesus said, man, we live not by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. True life comes through the word of God, not the world's possessions. It is written. Psalmist said, God, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He knew the power of God's word. It is what defeats the enemy in our life. The beast, the false prophet are captured. They're thrown into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. The first time Jesus came to earth, we saw him as this little child, humble and meek, the son of man to redeem us. He became like one of us so that he could redeem us to God. But this time he's coming as a conquering warrior. There will be no meekness about him. He will come to conquer Babylon, the system of sin and evil and darkness that rules this world will come to naught and will be no more. And we will begin to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will begin to sit and feast on the things that God had always intended for us to feast on. I mean, you can go back to the Garden of Eden. God said every tree, it was all about feasting on the things of God. Every tree of the garden you might freely eat. And we think of that, you know, our stupid minds, we think apple tree, peach tree, pear tree, cherry tree. No. There was a tree of light. There was a tree of joy. There was a tree of uh, 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 peace. There was a tree of love. There was a tree of prosperity. There was a tree of health. There was a tree of strength. There was a tree of wisdom a tree of knowledge, a tree of revelation. I mean, every good thing that you could ever want in life. There was a tree. God said, I've given these all feet on these things. He wanted our lives to just be so awesomely filled with every good thing of heaven. And we blew it. But it will all be restored as we sit down at that marriage supper of the Lamb. We will be in heaven. God said, I prepare a table for you to feast on in the presence of your enemies. Here the enemies will be gone and will begin to feast on all the glories of heaven. The bride of Christ united with our groom. And then there'll be a honeymoon. We're going to talk about that next week. There'll be a honeymoon and a judgment. And we'll talk about that. People don't want to talk about the judgment. But if you're a believer, the judgment's an awesome thing, a very positive thing. It's not something we're to fear. When you receive God, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. And he talks about fear involving torment. It's that fear of judgment, that fear of death, that fear of being tormented. When you receive perfect love into your life, all that fear disappears. You don't fear death when you're serving God and you're passionately in love with him, you look forward to it. And I'll tell you why next week, why we look forward to it. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads before the Lord this morning. God is so good. Oh, God, you're so good. If you're here today in the auditorium or you're watching us online and you're not certain where you stand in all of this, I said, we as believers will not experience any of this because we'll be gone. God will have taken us into heaven before this war of Armageddon and all this destruction. Something that we will not be uh, in, affected by. We will not be on the bad side of it, but we'll be on the good side of it. If we've received Christ as our Lord and Savior, today's your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. I believe God is here right now. And if you're watching us online, I believe he's right where you are today. 
And in the book of Revelation, he says, I'll stand at the door of your heart and I'll knock. He doesn't say, I'll bust the door down, I'll force my way in. He won't do that. The bride has to make herself ready. It's a decision to serve God and worship. He doesn't want robots that he controls. He wants to be worshiped by choice. He wants you to love him. Not because he makes you love him, but because you choose to love him. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that choice this morning. To say, God, I want to give you my life. I want to serve you. I want to know you. I want to be that intimately close with you. I want to be so clothed with the glory of God that when people look at me, they see you. I want to return with you someday on that white horse to conquer this evil and this evil world that has wreaked havoc in my life. He's knocking. You open the door through a simple prayer. Not words, but it's a prayer of consecration. It's a prayer of commitment. And I'm going to lead you in that prayer right now. We're all going to pray it together. But if that's you, you say, Pastor, I, I want to make that commitment to God today. Well, people are praying. I'm going to ask you to take one step of faith. This is just your way of admitting, I need God today. Just lift your hand up. And you can put it right back down. We're not here to point you out, embarrass you. You're, you're just saying, I, I need this today. I'm committing my life to God today watching us online, wherever you're at, just shoot that hand up, say, this is me today, this is me. And you can put it right back down. It's, it's between you and God, but I believe it's important for you to say, I'm doing this today, I'm in, I'm in. Let's pray it together. Press through your pride, your fear. Say this with me, say, God, I need you. I want you. I open my heart and I invite you to take control of my life. I ask you, God, to save me from this destruction. I receive you as my Savior. And I commit, uh, excuse me, I confess that I have sinned. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I commit my life to you today. I choose to serve you with all of my heart from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, it's not the prayer that will change you or save you. It's the commitment. And so I encourage you, man, we want to teach you more about God. We want to help you get closer to him. The best way I know that is for you to come and worship with us on Sunday mornings. If you're not plugged into a good church, this is a great one. Find one that you can get plugged into. A pastor that will teach you the Bible. A pastor that will pray with you and help you to learn more about God and be close to Him. And I encourage you that tell somebody, tell me, tell somebody that you gave your life to God today. And then start telling your friends about what God's doing in your life. And then bring them to church with you so they can experience this too. Amen? Remember, today is Connection Sunday. I hope you can stick around with us. If you're new, if you brought somebody with you, feel free to, to bring them down uh, to our Connection time. But uh, let's get to know each other better. Maybe you've been to a Connection Sunday. We've got cookies and coffee and stuff for you out in the lobby. Don't be in a hurry today. Uh, stick around and get to know each other better. Don't forget, we're coming up on Easter Sunday. You've got a couple weeks to invite somebody. It's going to be great. Greatest Sunday of the year to invite people to church. So find somebody you can bring with you. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week.